late 1960s and 70s, India is recorded to have cultivated and grown about 100,000 varieties. Rice is, must be a part of the meal in most of the cases. So uh, that's why Indian uh, economy is mainly based on agriculture and Indian agriculture essentially is around rice. Some of the varieties which I had collected even six years or five years back are no longer in cultivation in those same farmer's fields. They have, again, you know, changed over to modern varieties and chemical farming. So what we now have in Vrihi Seed Bank are virtually the last collection of the remaining seed diversity, uh, rice diversity in Eastern India. This is uh, so far the, the largest non-government seed bank in Eastern India. Uh, we started it because I found that the uh, evanescent seeds of different varieties of rice, which uh, once were being cultivated in Eastern India, were gradually, uh, through disuse, was vanishing, was disappearing very fast. And so to protect this genetic diversity and to stall this process of erosion of genetic diversity, I started conserving the seeds uh, in situ, uh, through in situ cultivation, by growing and donating the seeds to the farmers and then establishing a, a network of exchange, uh, an informal network of exchange among the farmers. So, so far we have distributed the seeds to farmers from 12 districts of West Bengal and also another four, four districts from Bihar, three districts from Orissa, one district from Assam and all these. And they all come over there and then uh, they choose the varieties. They have to just tell the nature or the type of the land where they want to grow this, the rice varieties like lowland or upland or dryland or and so on. So according to their uh, needs and choices, we show them the array of the varieties that we have. So for example, there would be 42 varieties suited to the upland conditions. Then maybe another uh, 200 varieties suited to the medium land conditions like that. And six varieties suited to the saline conditions. And each of these have different other properties as well, like the length and the size of the grain, the color of the grain, the aroma, the flavor, the cooking time, everything else is different. So then they choose uh, from among these varieties uh, for free of cost, of course. And the only rule is that they have to give to Brihi another variety of their own local production. The purpose is, is that uh, this variety that we collect from the farmers in exchange will be given over to another farmer in need. So Vihi becomes a center of, of exchange because uh, I believed that this informal network of exchange of crop varieties is the only way and the best way uh, to, to conserving them because this is a, an explicit challenge to the market economy, the market system, where farmers rely on the seed supply on the market and they have to purchase the seeds that they need. But until this advent of market economy, people had been exchanging for centuries and centuries and that's why these hundreds and even thousands of varieties uh, were distributed across the country. What is the danger of this huge biodiversity loss? Um, isn't one rice variety enough? Factors that we lose sight of in the, in the frenzy of development in agriculture is that there are many, many marginal conditions, environmental conditions or farm environmental conditions where modern varieties cannot grow because they lack the genes which are locally adapted and perfectly adapted and fine-tuned to those local conditions. I mean, as I told you, there's drought tolerance, flood tolerance, salinity tolerance, and aroma, fragrance. 
these four characteristics are the properties which have not yet been developed in any of the modern varieties so far despite 60 years of rice genetics research all over the world. So for example no high yielding variety or no modern variety is aromatic and no aromatic variety is high yielding or modern. The major risk of the erosion of genetic diversity of any crop not just rice is that when you lose the varieties and, and more and more number of the variety uh, varieties from the species of a crop we tend to lose a significant part I mean larger and larger part of the gene pool of the species so uh, in the case of rice if you just consider from 100,000 varieties we are left to an estimated 3,000 varieties in India or within the state of West Bengal from 5,600 varieties we now have only about six, uh, 500 varieties left which is less than 10 percent that means 90 percent of the gene di genetic diversity among the germplasm is lost and this reminds us of the risk of what happened in Ireland in 1880s uh, with the Irish potato famine and because there was only one variety in Ireland and one crop failure because of a disease outbreak, a pathogenic outbreak, the entire country suffered from this famine and that was a key factor which drove out millions of Irish people to the US. What is the intention of the international corporations to enter the Indian market? Just profit maximization. In fact, uh, in the 1970s, there was uh, one of the CEO of a big uh, industrial corporation commented that today's politics is biopolitics. Because today we know that it doesn't matter uh, or no country is now willing to capture the political seat of, of administration. Uh, rather it's much easier and more uh, powerful, I mean more uh, tangible and easier to control a country's economy and politics if one can capture the country's food security, and food production basis. So the means of food, food production and the, the, the materials of food production, the seeds for example, and the, the machinery of food production, the fertilizer, the pesticide, the irrigation machinery, everything is captured, then uh, we don't have to send armies to capture the country because the country is, uh, is you know, forced to, to relent and to you know, comply with whatever demand imposes. What is a GM seed? That's genetically modified seeds, or it's actually also called transgenic seeds. And they are promoting this transgenic seed uh, with a very explicit concept of controlling the agricultural means of production in all the countries, not just one country, all over the world, by uh, imposing a system of monolithic control of production so that every single farmer in the, on this earth eventually has to depend on the supply of those seeds on that particular com company. So for example the Roundup Ready uh, soya or Roundup Ready any other crops of Monsanto is designed to promote the sale of Roundup which is a herbicide, it's a glyphosate based herbicide and this herbicide uh, kills off all this you know, natural crop but Roundup Ready is a type of crop which is genetically modified which is designed genetically to bypass the respiratory mechanism to bypass the toxic effect of Roundup the glyphosate herbicide so that even if you apply herbic this herbicide this Roundup Ready crop alone will survive this assault all other crops will perish and eventually after a few years of cultivation 
the farmer has to depend only on the supply of this Roundup Ready seeds because on that farm nothing else can grow. We produce zero greenhouse gases. We don't burn anything, we don't use anything. Cement of course is external factor altogether. So it's a virtually zero ecological footprint for the entire building. And zero ecological footprint from the agricultural practices that we are performing because it's zero irrigation, zero agrochemicals. And even the input of manures that we do is from our own farm manure and also from the dry toilet that we have established. So everything is a kind of you now internalized. All of these is a self-sustained model for the initial watering of the saplings from the seeds to grow for any vegetables, for example. We need to water, not irrigation, I mean, not flooding with, the, with pump irrigation or canal irrigation, but we have to make you know, maybe half a cup of this or even less than this much of water for the saplings every week just to allow them to grow. And once they take roots, it's the land management with mulching and different other types of management of the soil condition that establishes themselves. And that proves that this is a myth, uh, that uh, irrigation is the, is the only factor that reduces production. So these experiments and also different kinds of techniques of agriculture, different techniques of organic pesticides application and their dosage uh, we all verify before recommending and prescribing to the farmers. We never prescribe anything, neither any variety of seed nor any technique of, or process of cultivation unless we verify and endorse it on our own farm after several years of experimentation with different controlled dosage and different kinds of repeated, replicated uh, testing. So I had to convince myself about the the efficacy and the viability of the model. So after I got this, these examples from different indigenous societies, not only from South Asia but also Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia and America, then we collated this experience and then built this model. So of course it's possible because in many countries where it may not be rice seed bank, it could be seed bank of quinoa or some fruits in Europe, for example. But the principle is the same. It's local self-sustainability, depending on the local, locally produced uh, uh, seeds of indigenous diversity, indigenous varieties. And of course, no access of the seed bank for, the, for everyone, of all the willing farmers, uh, not in exchange of money, but in exchange of varieties between them. This could of course be replicated. And over these dozen of years, I convinced myself that this is viable. So what I am telling is what I am doing. And all the understanding that I have got emanated from my own practical experience from the field. But I am creating my own niche in this one or recreating or rediscovering a new model and mode of living, uh, which I'm very fortunate to have many friends and peer groups you know, cooperating with me. And slowly, this is an expanding circle. And so we have created some pockets of, of liberation.